I practiced for four years. Sorry, go ahead. We, we, we record these, so I didn't do it. So uh -huh. go, ahead. go for it. So I've been uh, practicing as a chiropractor now for 42 years in Utah. Um, I, uh, I also have a PhD in nutritional sciences. So I guess to, to start this out, for you to kind of understand the direction I'm going to be going, uh, I'll probably have to give you a little background, if that's okay. I hope it doesn't bore you too much. I guess you can always mute me if you need to. But I, uh, my, uh, my father was a barber in World War II on an aircraft carrier, so he was the ship's barber. Afterwards, he set up a, a barber shop in Salt Lake City. While he was doing that, uh, was when I was born. I was born in Salt Lake City, and he had someone come in one time and was discussing chiropractic with him. He'd never heard of a chiropractor, but it intrigued him enough to look into it and decided he would actually go back to school and become a chiropractor. So uh, he closed shop and we went back to Davenport, Iowa. My first four years of my life was uh, living in an army barracks uh, while he went to school for four years. At the conclusion of that, uh, when he graduated, we moved back to Utah again. He, we moved to a small little community of about 300 people and bought a family farm. And it was a beautiful little community called Spring Lake. It was a spring-fed lake that I spent a lot of time there growing up. We had uh, a couple of acres of fruit. We had cows. We had horses. We had pigs. We had chickens and turkeys and ducks and everything. So we uh, had about 500 chickens. We uh, we uh, we sold lots of we sold lots of uh, we sold lots of uh, raw milk, raw cream. Uh, we made our own soap. Uh, it was an interesting life. We had a big garden. Like I said, we had lots of fruit trees. We sold a lot of uh, products in a just a little stand we set up. And really, there was no, in the town I was in, there was no stores. There was a single gas pump on a little market where you could buy, I guess, penny candy and maybe some fish baits so you could fish at the lake. And uh, it was a good time to be raised for sure. When I was old enough to start working on the farm, there was 10 of us. That was not uncommon back then. It took a lot of people to run a farm. And so I, uh, I started working on the farm as I got older and milking cows and taking care of the farm. And uh, pretty soon I had more responsibility than I could possibly do. Uh, seemed like we ran around in shorts without, uh, without our shoes and shirts on. Uh, I'm sure we didn't have any vitamin D deficiency at that time. And uh, our feet got tough. Uh, we had usual childhood diseases, I suppose, you know, measles, mumps, maybe whooping cough, but all we did is kept working and uh, associated. And I'm sure we got herd immunity in just a few days. I uh, don't remember anybody dying from any illnesses. Uh, I did from farm accidents back when I was about 10. I had a farming accident where I broke my back and that uh, I didn't even know about until years later when uh, we took an x-ray and I saw what I'd done. But needless to say, I had a sore back for a long time. It didn't seem to stop uh, the farm work. And uh, we, uh, we milked uh, Jersey and Guernsey cows. So we got lots of cream we had a little milk house and a separator that would separate the cream and the milk and so I would uh, we would sell the cream uh, I remember it was a dollar a quart people liked it because it wouldn't pour out of the jar they could thin it down and still uh, whip cream and they liked that and uh, anyway it was a it was a good it was a good farm we never had to go to a store there wasn't a store there anyway but all we had was a church and a, and a lake and a few people and we had lots of lots of farms Anyway, I remember one time I was probably about eight years old and my mother decided to go to the next city and my brother and I went with her. She went, there was a bakery there and a, and a store, it was a department store. So she was gonna go buy some shoes or something. She went into the, uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the bakery there and she bought six loaves of white bread. And I remember first seeing that, that was a new <laughs> introduction to our lifestyle. She, uh, baked 10 loaves of bread. She was always baking, cooking and cleaning. She was uh, an amazing mother. But anyway, so she went over to this store, the department store, and me and my brother were sitting there and that bread smelled pretty good and we got bored very fast. So we decided we would just eat the bread. So we took the loaves out and we noticed it was very spongy. So we started making balls out of the dough and throwing it at each other. And then we'd eventually eat it. And in time we ate all six loaves and it really didn't fill me up. Uh, 
Of course, when my mother came back out, she was not very happy with what we did. And uh, I noticed I didn't have to use the bathroom for a couple of days. My dad actually gave me a couple of cascara sagrada, you know, just to clean me out. Right now, look at that, almost 97% of Warnock. And uh, so that was my introduction to kind of refined foods. Uh, like I said, we had a big farm. I remember one time I took my bow down to the lake and I shot fish and took, took it back to the garden and I planted a fish underneath each of the uh, tomato plants because I'd heard about that. The pioneers had done that or no, I guess it was the pilgrims had done that. And uh, that was a bad mistake because that night, I think every wild dog and coyote in the county found those and dug everything back up again. So I don't know if the Native Americans even had dogs, but anyway, I didn't use that tech technique anymore, but we continued to, uh, we were healthy and we enjoyed the farm life. As I got older, we also worked for other farmers in the valley, hauling hay and all of us worked on a dairy. I had another dairy. I would milk 80 cows every morning and night in addition to what we had at home. And it seemed like you never got done, but anytime I had any time, I'd go down and swim my horse across the lake. I had a good horse and a good dog. They told me if I didn't have a good horse and a good dog, I couldn't be trusted. So I did. Uh, when I was young, I built a raft and I kept it in the reeds there and I'd go out and shoot bullfrogs at night. And I still like frog legs. That's one of my favorite foods. And anyway, it was a, a nice lake. Uh, with that horse, I learned all, since I'm living at the foot of tall mountains, I learned every trail and every ridge on that mountain. We hunted and fished as a family and we always had something to eat. Uh, didn't make many trips to any stores. When I got in high school, I got into sports. Uh, my dad saved me many times in playing football and wrestling and all the things I did. Yeah, it, was, uh, it was good to have a dad that was a chiropractor and he was good at it. So. When I graduated <clears throat> and uh, went on to college, I had a, I wrestled in college and had a track scholarship down in, in uh, Texas. And so I traveled and competed all through the South. And anyway, when I finally I got married and uh, finally found out I couldn't afford to go to school. So I quit and uh, came back to Utah. I joined the Carpenters Union and started working in, uh, in carpentry, mostly commercial. And we were building big buildings and I remember we had a strike and I had to go up and work on a power plant up in Wyoming. It was a huge power plant and we lived in a camp and we ate in a common trailer. After about two or three days of eating the food in that common trailer, I noticed I had a very difficult time urinating and I couldn't figure out what was happening here. And that was my introduction to refined foods, uh, really trans fats, uh, at least partially hydrogenated oils, microwave foods, all the things I had never eaten before. And it was really, I, I felt like I was 70 years old when I'd stand at the urinal. I didn't know if I was gonna have to get catheterized or not. But fortunately that, uh, that ended before too long and I was able to come back home to my wife's cooking, which uh, I got back to normal within a couple of days. But I learned that there was some things going on that in the food industry that probably wasn't very good for us. And uh, I decided, I was working on actually my last job, I was actually ironically building a hospital, a large hospital. I was up on the top floor. We were pouring a slab and, and it was in the middle of the winter. It was snowing. It was cold. My fingers were numb. And I, I looked around at the other carpenters. And I thought, do I really want to do this for 30 years, even if the pay was good? And I decided I didn't. So I took my tools over to the elevator shaft. I poured them down the elevator shaft. And then I just reached up and emptied I put concrete right on top of them. That kind of gave me a commitment to leave. So I went back to school and mm -hmm. still exactly what I needed to do, but I went back to school and, uh, and I decided maybe I would look into chiropractic since it had helped me out so much. And I checked with some different schools and found out what their requirements were. And uh, so I completed my undergraduate re uh, requirements and I ended up being accepted after the second try to Los Angeles chiropractic college down in Glendale. So we moved down there. I had three children at the time, went down there for four years and uh, it was difficult. We lived on a lot of potatoes and eggs, I think, and we didn't have too much of a budget to work on, but I pursued that. And after I finished my year internship, then we decided we would move back to Utah again. My father was about to retire. I had a good practice in California. I could have stayed there, but uh, I thought, well, that'll be a great opportunity to go back and have an office and a, and a clientele. So I went back and, and uh, he retired and I took over his practice. After a few years, he wanted to sell it, which he did. And I moved to where I am currently. And I've been here for about 40 years, I suppose. So I started practicing. I felt 
good at what I did. I was enjoying helping people, improving their quality of life. I found it was easier to keep people healthier, healthy than it was to fix them with chronic conditions, but I didn't have that luxury very often. So uh, for about 10 years, I did well. And then my success started to kind of go down. I wasn't having the same success I was used to. One day I had a farmer come in and he uh, said he had jumped off a tractor and hurt his back. <clears throat> and so I treated him a few times and uh, wasn't having any success at all. And he asked me a question one day. He says, do you think sugar has anything to do with my back pain? I says, well, I'm sure it's not helping anything, but I really don't know. And he, I says, do you know a lot of sugar? And he says, well, my brother owns a uh, candy store. So I help myself every night when I finish on the farm. And he says, I think I'm going to try two weeks without eating any candy and see what happens. So I treated him for two more weeks and he's back completely resolved. So I, I kind of had my eyes open to maybe there's another aspect of healthcare that I need to look at. And uh, I, uh, it was interesting because about that time I had bought a book, just a typical fad book on health. And I thought, you know, I'm still in pretty good shape, but I probably have to put a little more effort into it. And I followed that protocol for about six months. And then all of a sudden I started to having difficult urination, urination again. So I, I uh, and I noticed blood in the urine and I, I tested myself and I was diabetic. So I decided I needed to make a change and I figured there had to be some kind of an epigenetic answer to an epigenetic problem because the genome was still the same. And so I started to look at maybe some possible alternatives to what I was doing. And I ran across a Dr. Schwartzbain. Dr. Schwartzbain was an endocrinologist. Uh, her specialty was really thyroid, I think, but she says she was moved to a diabetic clinic of some kind. She thought, well, if I'm going to work there, I'm going to figure it out. Said she drew blood seven times a day on every patient, trying to figure out how to fix them. And she says, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. They were following protocols. You know, they were avoiding uh, fat. They were using carbohydrates. They were, uh, and they were still losing their feet and their eyesight. And she made a, she made a, day, a discovery. She says, you know what I discovered? is when I gave them their fat back, I cured the diabetes. So I thought, well, that's interesting. And she actually wrote another book on just uh, some dietary menus and stuff, which I really enjoyed. So I started looking back at my life on the farm. And of course that was, we hardly ever drank milk. I, I use cream on everything. You know, I get a homemade piece of bread and pour cream on it. Maybe squeeze a little honey on the top. There just wasn't anything better than that to me. And it uh, satisfied it. And I thought, well, I'm going to go back to the old way here again, if I can find it. I wasn't on the farm anymore, but I still had access. And I thought, what has happened to us in the 20th century? And I, I did a little research and I, I just noted down a few things that I thought I would just notice, just, just mention to you. So I noticed nuclear development was really 1905. It continued up through 1941, but Grain milling, you know, stripping germs and uh, germ and nutrients from our grains. I remember Dr. Wiley, I think it was about 1896. He really formed the precursor of the FDA. <clears throat> and in uh, 1908, they passed the Wiley Act, which made it illegal to enrich food and to refine sugar. And enriching food was very interesting because they took out 33 minerals and only put four back in. I asked one time, which four do you choose? And they said, and I thought, well, I guess we don't need God anymore now that we're smarter than what he put in the food. So anyway, the Wiley Act was passed in 1908. It was actually a felony. And, and the, the big food giants and their attorneys went after him and, and, and took that all away from him. And from him and we have what we have the FDA today. But I thought that was interesting. Artificial lights were introduced in 1924. I mean, I could explain all this, the effects of all these, but I, we don't have time probably to do that. General Foods invented Betty Crocker. That was to introduce and sell refined foods. That was in 1921. Fake foods started developing in 1950. Our first supermarket was in 1947. We did finally get a grocery store. I think I was a teenager when that happened, uh, but it was in a, a town a little ways away. It wasn't in the town I was in. The town I was raised in still doesn't have a grocery store. <clears throat> uh, from 1950 to 1990, there were approximately 320,000 fake foods introduced. In 1977, high fructose corn syrup was imported from Japan. 1990 to 2005, there was 120,000 new fake foods introduced. Fake sweeteners were introduced in 1970. And I could explain the, 
the biochemistry of all this, but I'll just kind of give you the, the highlights. In 2001, there were $110 billion spent on fast food. So one out of four families has a fast food meal every day. Now, this is clear back in 2001. It's a lot worse now, but this just happened to be the data I had. Uh, 1970, there was uh, $6 billion spent on fast foods. In 2012, there was $125 billion spent on fast foods. 1971, uh, the USDA produced a paper. It was called An Evaluation of Research in the United States on Human Nutrition. Now, it was banned for 21 years <clears throat> because it directly blamed loss of nutrients for the standard American diet and for all disease. It became available again in the 90s. You can Google it and read it if you want. It's an evaluation of research in the United States on human nutrition. Uh, data from the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System, which I thought was very interesting, tracks 52 infectious diseases. And it's uh, each year in the US it's done. And it's interesting, of the 10 most frequently reported illnesses, 87% were sexually transmitted. The U.S. has the highest rate of sexually transmitted diseases of any developed country. <clears throat> I remember I read an article in a paper one day, so it had to be true because it was in the newspaper. But what it did is it took uh, each state by state. And in that article, it said we have approximately 5% of the world lives in the United States. <clears throat> and uh, we consume 65% of the world's drugs. And I thought that can't be good. And I looked state to state and it was really kind of disappointing that Utah was three times the national average. So anyway, uh, I decided we probably didn't have a nutritional deficiency. I had a, uh, I pursued actually a PhD in nutritional sciences when this all came about. I started having more interest in that. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know if it made, it made me any smarter because I had, a, I had an associate actually who had a, got his PhD out of Berkeley. And he says, it took me about 10 years to get my PhD and about 20 years to get over it. And I found uh, if I was going to have somebody build me a house and they had just graduated from school and they had the diploma on the wall and I had another guy down the street that never been to school and for 30 years he was building houses, who would you choose? I think I would choose the autodidact, the experienced one who had already made the errors and the mistakes. I decided it takes a good disease to get healthy. Uh, diabetes was a blessing in my life. It took about a year for me to figure that out. And that all, it hasn't been a problem since, but it was a great learning opportunity for me. And I would say since uh, moving more into the uh, nutritional aspect of my practice, probably half is chiropractic and about half is in the biochemistry world, you know, and I've seen every condition I think known to man. I, I'm quick to say I don't treat cancer, I don't treat heart disease, I don't treat diabetes, but I certainly treat a lot of people with it. I, I noticed it was interesting as I started running blood work and I've run tens of thousands of blood tests now that the averages basically are what blood tests tell us. If you go and just observe who goes through a blood lab, they're not very healthy. And to take 10,000 people, divide it in half and give them four standard devi deviations and call that normal, I thought was disappointing. So I had to start changing things to make them functional instead of clinical. And it made a big difference. In my opinion, a borderline diabetic is like saying borderline pregnant. I never could understand that. So there was a professor at the, one of the schools I attended doing undergraduate studies, Dr. Black, and he gave a lecture one time. It was very interesting to me. I, even, I still have an old recording of that. And it was a, it was a study that he referred to and it, it kind of caught my attention. It was a, he said, a large group of people were studied. They used blood work to determine levels of nutrition, which is a very poor test. You can't really do blood work very well and find nutrients because all you're going to get is what's in the train and not what gets there. So there were four groups of people. Basically, it said they found everyone fell into one of these four groups. The first group was the emotionally distressed. That's like depression, schizophrenia. And their diet was classified as abominable. The second group was the junk food junkies. They ate all the garbage they wanted without any concern for health, and they admitted it. Number three was the interesting one. It says the anxious health eaters. They ate perfectly without deviation. In fact, if you offered them anything less than perfect, they would turn it down. Then we had the non-anxious health eaters. 
they ate well to get the value that eating good food gave to them. But when they were offered less than optimum food from those they associated with, they would accept it because they valued the social principle higher than the nutritional principle. Now, it got interesting because when they evaluated the blood levels of nutrients, all four groups, they discovered there was only now three groups. Two of them had merged. The lowest nutrient level came from group number one. That was the emotion, emotionally distressed. <clears throat> Groups two and three had merged as the same and only slightly better than group number one. The reason was the anxious stresses of group number three consumed the value of good eating. Obviously, the best levels were in group number four. The biggest difference in levels of blood nutrients seemed to be affected mostly by eating to avoid negative consequences versus eating to create positive consequences. Exercises, by the way, when people exercised, it had the same result. It had to do with the attitude we approach when we engage in exercise. So anyway, I always approach when I take a patient that's really uh, struggling with health and they really have some poor habits. I always try to explain that principle to them. Uh, we're not trying to make, we're not trying to eat perfect, it's impossible. If you eat organic, you're gonna still get a, at least 300 chemicals a day. We live in a dirty, polluted world. <clears throat> And I think it's interesting that as I, I looked at uh, Rutgers University, for example, they put out a study every year of homegrown versus store-bought. For example, it took 1,242 tomatoes in a grocery store equivalent to one grown home in a bucket. Dr. Kavanaugh at Cornell said, we only really die of one disease. He says, we die of malnutrition. So I was learning that we're not really getting, we're buying, we're, we're, we're dying with a belly full of food that is not nutritious. But I wanted people to understand that a lot of this is really mental. You don't have to beat yourself up if you're not perfect. We just have to make improvement. So as I started doing more blood work and looking to the details of what I could find and try to make some changes, both dietarily and nutritionally, <clears throat> I found that the average gut function of a patient, had one today, uh, gut function was at 6%. I'm surprised we can even live at 6%, but it is really the average that I see. And that's, I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of patients between five and 10%. So I thought, why should I give a nutrient for a condition when the gut is not functioning? It was a waste of time. I got caught in that dilemma. Okay, I'll, because you have uh, sleep issues, I'll give you this vitamin that should help you sleep. It never works. It was a total failure. So I had to realize there was something bigger here. And so I decided to just focus on the gut. And as a, the gut would improve, and the gut really needs six things, to, if you just do that, and then just avoid the real bad things, the pro-inflammatories, those things that turn to sugar fast, even in the so-called healthy world, the gut really does respond fast. The enterocyte turns over every couple of days. It's very, very fast. And I focus more, more on the IgA and the IgM in the gut, IgG if it was chronic and autoimmune disease, but that's where I focused. And that enterocyte responds if you'll just give it the right food. Now you have to realize that that enterocyte is, a, is coated in lipoprotein, it loves fat. And when we go off that, it really does suffer. When you think of prebiotics, we're talking about fiber, probiotics, which is the three and a half pounds of bacteria we have in the gut. And then we have postbiotics. Postbiotics is what we're after. One of those is butyrate, one's propionate. Butyrate is a two carbon chain fat that comes from butter. So maybe, maybe Isaiah was right when he said the Savior learned wisdom by eating butter and honey. That's good enough for me anyway. So the research that I've read is a little bit frustrating because you can see both ways. I mean, you can find about anything you want, but I discovered something very interesting. In fact, I discovered it when I was writing the dissertation for my PhD, that there is a lot of myths in research. I remember one time I was, I was testifying as a special witness in court and the attorney said, uh, can you find research that proves both sides of the argument? And I said, yes, absolutely you can. And if the research is not really good research, and there is great research out there. I like Pub, PubMed. I was reading PubMed uh, not long ago and I was reading the Honolulu study. The Honolulu study was interesting because there were 20,000 people involved over 20 years and all over the age of 65. And all they were doing is tracking cholesterol and longevity. At the end of that 20 years, they had a conclusion. They said that we don't understand because they said the higher the cholesterol, the longer they lived and the lower, the quicker they died. 
So the conclusion was we don't understand, but we don't recommend any kind of uh, cholesterol lowering medication for anyone over the age of 65. There's a lot of studies out there like that. The, the Framingham study proved the same thing. So anyway, we have relative research and we have absolute. You know, absolute research is actually correct. Relative is used all the time, but it's really, really uh, deceiving. If you don't take the time to read the report, it's uh, the research results, you'll find that it's really very ineffective, very ineffective. So I started to look at nutrients and I started to add those in. Now, a nutrient is a supplement. It only supplements the food we eat. And if they're eating garbage and they're trying to take a supplement and think they're going to feel better, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So they have to change some lifestyle. That's all, that's, that's all you can do. So I became, uh, I, I gained more success. I, people got better by changing lifestyle and adding nutrients into their uh, lifestyle. But over time, that started to degrade as well. I became unhappy with what I was seeing. So I, re I realized that vitamins were going through the same process as the food was. People were finding better ways to make cheaper vitamins, make them faster, and make a lot of money. There's big money made in that. But as I started to look at those and look at the processes, there were was, there was so many that had so many convenient toxic tagalongs like gums, glues, binders, and fillers that it totally rendered the supplement ineffective. And it was, it was hard to find. Now, there's good companies out there and there's good supplements, but there's not many. In fact, I read a study once that said you had a 2.5% chance of finding a vitamin that either worked or didn't hurt you. And that was pretty disappointing. I thought, wow. But as I started to look at it, I saw coal tar derivatives, you know, synthetic vitamins. Yeah, I saw essentially, for lack of a better term, WD-40 that made it so they could make 60,000 bottles an hour. And it really made the product ineffective. Now, if I let the mules go in a, in a field of hay, and I have first crop hay and fourth crop hay, the mules always go to the first crop hay. Now, the fourth crop is still hay, and you can still sell it as hay. But for some reason, the mules know what's the healthiest for them, and they'll go to first crop every time. <clears throat> so I decided to try to find some first crop. And I started sourcing. I went to different companies to see how hard it would be to formulate a nutrient. Because at this point in time, I'd seen tens of thousands of patients. I realized many things that don't work. The best research I've done is over 42 years on the tens of thousands of patients that I've treated. Our success is good now, and I have a successful practice. But I've had to, uh, the first company I went to, they had their way of doing things, and they were already wealthy. And so they're not going to slow their machine down and make 500 bottles for me. It's just not going to happen. So I had to move on and move on. I found another company that said they would do it. And then they, uh, they, they would change things in my formula. It just upset me. So uh, I finally found one. I found one up in Oregon, actually. And they're a very custom you know, formula company. And they said, we'll do exactly what you say. And I said, now you have to do the exact milligrams, I say, and the exact amounts that I say. And they said, we can do that. So we started sourcing ingredients around the world, really, except I didn't go to China. But if, if, uh, if Moringa products were best, better in India, we got it from India. If uh, coconut products are better in the Philippines, we went to the Philippines. And we just got really good quality product. It's hard to do that. It's very hard. And the first one I tried to do was one that uh, I was invited to go down to the uh, National Rodeo Finals years ago. I see a lot of cowboys. Now, world champion came in and he says, I need to have you get me through these next 10 days. Would you come down? So I went down. I ended up taking care of cowboys while I was down there. And I did that for quite a few years. <clears throat> and then I had another cowboy ask me, he says, is there anything you could produce that would help us get over our injuries every week? Because we're getting on an animal that wants to kill us. And we do it every week. And in the national finals, it's almost every day. So is there something we can do to get over this fast? So I says, I'll, I'll tackle that. So I ended up with 54 ingredients that I sourced that were all clean and good quality first crop hay, if you will. And... Uh, then I, I run into a second problem. That problem was when I started to put the ingredients together, I found out, for lack of a better term, I'll call it autophagy. But she'll take, you know, in quantum physics, one plus one should make three. Each ingredient should enhance the benefit of the other. And I found that some did and some didn't. And that's difficult to do. So it took me about a year and a half of testing each ingredient against all the other ingredients before I came, before I was satisfied. I ended up, instead of 54 ingredients, I ended up with 19. <clears throat> but they were all happy 
they were all uh, the Christmas tree lights came on and it became very successful. And it, it, it had anti-inflammatories, you know, muscle builders, energy builders, all the things like that. And it was very healthy and they could take it easily. It was in a powder. So it made it hard because then you have to work with flavor. And I'm not about to put in artificial sweeteners or caffeine or something like that, that I see in most of them. Uh, so I just stayed with the ingredients I had. I just had to adjust a few ingredients. <clears throat> and I tested on a few people and see how they were doing. They said, it makes you feel good, but it makes my throat burn. And so I looked at the ingredients and I thought, what's doing that? And I figured it must be the bromelain. So I started backing off the bromelain. I had 1,500 milligrams because it's such a great anti-inflammatory. So as I started reducing it down, and I was testing it actually on my front office, and they're, they're pretty picky, and they say, no, it burns my throat. So I went clear down to 50 milligrams <clears throat> before they said, this is good. To make up the gap, I increased quercetin, you know, a common known ionophore. And I did it as, a, as an anti-inflammatory, but as I increased the quercetin and filled the gap of what I needed to, to make that product. I didn't realize how beneficial it would be for the last two years that we've had to go through. Anyway, it's had incredibly good benefits. I had one not too long ago. She was uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. She would work one day, sleep 13 hours, uh, couldn't work the next day, had to recover. Then she'd go the following day back to work again. I says, well, let's, let's try this because I have covered a lot of, a lot of pathways in the body and putting this together. It's very difficult. And uh, she came back uh, like a week later and she says, what is the, she was looking at it saying, what is the secret ingredient? <clears throat> I says, there is no secret ingredient. And you'll know other ingredients. It says none. I says, it's, it's called synergism. You know, you can't, if you find, say you have eight ingredients uh, that are all good for the eyes. Say you have lutein, zeaxanthin, B2, vitamin A, whatever. And you put them together in a capsule. Now, logically, that should help your eyesight because research says all those ingredients are good. But they, it's like a drug. They never test the drugs together. They always test them individually. So when you put them together, I found it's about like putting a, I guess for lack of a better description, a Republican and a Democrat in the same capsule. And you don't get a good product. It doesn't work out very well. So that's what made it hard. And then makes it taste good was even more difficult. So I said, I'm not doing any more powders. That's too hard. I want to use a capsule. So I started into another product and we put another one together. They changed two ingredients in that. And I says, you don't understand. I said, do not change anything in here. And they says, well, we're just using what we have in stock. And I says, well, I can't, I can't have that. I mean, magnesium glycinate has a different frequency than magnesium citrate. And I need magnesium citrate in this particular product. So we got that through, got it corrected and fixed. And then I did another one <clears throat> and I, and they only changed one ingredient on that. That was my uh, D3K2 product. And he changed only one ingredient. And I said, that's two strikes, you know, three strikes you're out. I just won't, I can't compromise on this it has to be exactly right. And it is really a pain. So uh, anyway, we got that done. And since then I've produced more, I'm not going to produce a lot of products. Uh, Matrix Formulations is the name of the company, but it's like this, and it's it's very clean and it's very synergistic. I was reading an article. Dr. Fritz Pop is one of the smartest people I run into, and he's a quantum physicist over in Germany, and he photographed one cell talking to another with light. Now that intrigues me. So I believe that every cell in your body knows what every other cell in your body is doing, and if you give it the right the right food, whether it's a supplement or food, it's going to respond to that. And there's a reason why beet greens are good for the liver. It's because they vibrate at the same frequency as a healthy liver. And food works that way and supplements work that way. It's difficult to put that together. I'm a little bit OCD in that world, but if it doesn't work, and I tested on a lot of people before we produce it, I just want to make sure it works. And we've had good success with that. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot more I could say about this. I don't know how far you want me to go into this, but I think I've given you a pretty good feel for what I'm doing. Um, I don't know if I should keep talking or if you want to ask questions or uh, what do you recommend? Keep going. Keep talking. Keep talking? Yep. Okay. So I've had, 
I watched, my, I watched a, a show the other day. You probably have seen it. It's uh, called Alone. It's a series of people. They'll take 10 people out and drop them somewhere. If they can survive 100 days, to get a million dollars. This was in the Arctic. And so I was curious to see how that would go. And I haven't watched that before. One of my kids said, you got to watch that. They're mountain men like you are. Maybe you'll enjoy that. So I, I was watching. And I said to myself, the person that's going to survive this is the person that finds the fat. You know, when the uh, Cuban, ref Cuban refugees come up from Cuba and they stop them from going to Florida years ago, all they had in their pockets were vials of rancid fat. <clears throat> People understand what the, sat, the fat satiates. It, 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 it's, it's, it's good for you. So um, I was reading an article. Actually, I listened to him speak. He was from Germany and he talked about the war, World War II. And he says, when we lost ability to shop or buy anything at all, we just brought our stuff in wheelbarrows and we just wheeled them to the corner and we just exchanged. He says, it took about two hours to get the pecking order of what had the most value. And I was interested in what that order would be. So I was listening to him. He says, the first thing by far was people went to their addictions. When they're stressed out, they'll go to their addictions. So he said, alcohol and tobacco was number one. But as far as food went, he said, the number one item was fat. You could get anything with fat. He said, with a quarter fat, I could buy or exchange 500 pounds of potatoes. Interesting, he said also honey, he said honey had three times the bar to power sugar because people know that there's more food value. When they get in a situation like that, they just know what's good for them. Anyway, so I watched this series, it was interesting. And one by one, they would check out for one reason or another. It was, a, it was an incredible experience. The ones that were living on rabbits, basically they were snaring rabbits and squirrels. They didn't last very long. Uh, lean meat is, uh, doesn't do very well. The Inuit Eskimo does not die from heart disease. The Inuit Eskimo, even though they eat from 60 to 80% saturated fat in their diet, you know, what gets them is osteoporosis and scurvy. They don't get any fresh uh, vitamin C contained food. So when they kill a caribou, for example, they'll eat the adrenal because the adrenal is rich in vitamin C. But red meat has 44 more times phosphorus than it does calcium. And so red meat generates uh, osteoporosis and that's their problem, but it's not heart disease. So as they go through this process of the loan, they go one by one, they're <clears throat> trying to live off different animals. One guy killed a musk ox. He, he shot it with his bow and then he chased it down and stabbed it. He, he was a mountain man, but the only fat he found in the musk ox was around the organs. And so he savored that. That's what he ate the most. And uh, then he had to keep it away from bears and that sort of thing. But what uh, really saved several of them for quite a while was a porcupine. Porcupine is just nothing but a big butterball. And they would, when they got a porcupine, they knew they could live for several weeks because of the amount of fat in it. This particular gentleman that won, he, he became successful at catching fish. Out of Slave Lake, he would uh, made this simple way. He had to chop a hole with the ax and he'd, get, he'd drop this line down through a, a homemade lure, a, a chunk of squirrel meat or something on there. And he's able to catch fish, large lake trout. Of course, they're very, very rich in omega threes, and that was he was able to be satisfied by that. And by the time everyone eventually just had to leave, they just started to. He was doing just fine, but he was a rough <laughs> mountain man. He was used to that. The ox, he found most of the fat in the brain. He found it in the head. He ate the nose off because he says that's what the animals do. The wolves always eat the nose. He ate the fat out of the hoofs. And he ended up taking the stomach, opening it up and eating the contents out of the stomach because he knew he couldn't digest the grasses, but the muskox could. And it was already fermented. And so he'd put that in a pot and boil it and then he'd eat that. And he was actually very healthy. He didn't lose muscle mass or anything because of his, uh, but what he had discovered. But I just always noticed that, you know, that's what people are, that's what people benefit by. And the brain is nothing more than just a, a big blob of fat when it gets right down to it. So I've never restricted that. And I do restrict the plastic fats. You know, when we had introduced in our lifestyle, the, the trans fats, the partially hydrogenated oils, taking a polyunsaturate and, and heating it up, using nickel as a catalyst, breaking the carbon-carbon double bond and hydrogenated it. It just, I just call it a plastic fat. It's like a, it's like a melted charge card. And that's when all these problems started to come. That's really when heart disease and cancer and, and diabetes started to increase <clears throat> between that and the refined carbohydrate. 
I read books like Dr. Paul Stitt's book that was Beating the Food Giants. Here's a guy that worked for General Foods, worked for Kellogg, worked for um, Quaker, worked for Quaker. He was fired from all three of those jobs because he kept trying to put the minerals back in the food. They let him put the minerals back in uh, the animal food, but just not in the human food. And he was very frustrated because he couldn't make healthy food. They wouldn't let him do it. So he ended up back home. He was doing some research just on his own because he was licking his wounds and a, a radio program came on, which was kind of a, you know, a program where you could call and vent your frustrations. And he called and vented and they said, we need to have you on here because you got a lot of knowledge. He's a PhD in, in biochemistry. And so he went in and he stayed there for months. And then he opened up his own place and all of his employees, he required them to eat there because it was all non-enriched. It was all healthy food. Anyway, I thought that was a very interesting book. I read another book by uh, uh, Mark Anderson and Bernard Jensen. It was one on, uh, it's called Empty Harvest. It was the history of commercial agriculture. And just showing how the, the soils have been, you can't grow a hundred acres of the same product. The soil just can't handle it. I read Joe Nichols, uh, Dr. Joe Nichols, MD, but he was also bank president. He wouldn't give a loan to a farmer unless they put a winter cover crop in and they rotated their crops. <clears throat> and so we continue just to destroy the soil by expecting it to grow one product. Mother Nature never does that. Uh, I read uh, Pottinger's Cats. Pottinger's Cats was a very interesting one. That was uh, Weston Price and Francis Pottinger. He was an endocrinologist. And Weston Price was really a, a dentist. Some of the greatest nutritionists at the turn of the century were dentists because they could see oral health much easier than they could see cardiovascular disease. And as he was doing their green electomies on these cats, some survived better than others. And it, it was based on where they were getting the food to feed them. And it was Weston Price that said, let's do a study on these here cats. This was 1931. And so they had 900 cats over 10 years that they did studies on. And one of the studies they did was taking raw milk and pasteurized milk. Now, I visited uh, Altadena Dairy in California. It was the biggest producer, of because uh, I was in school down there, biggest producer of raw milk. And I went and asked him about a few things. And I said, you know, does any of your employees drink raw milk? And he says, they all do. They won't drink pasteurized. And I says, what's the purpose of pasteurization? I know we're taught that it's to destroy bacteria so someone doesn't get undulant or whatever. But I've drank enough milk that I'm sure the bacteria content was a little high. Uh, so I had this one Guernsey used to me all the time and sometimes your foot would go in the, in the bucket and if I didn't bring a bucket of milk up to the barn my dad would thrash me and so I just pulled her foot out and just kept milking but to get it through the filter it took about three changes because it was <laughs> the bacteria count was pretty high but we still drank it nobody got sick and you know so we didn't have any tuberculosis from that anyway so um, Pottinger went and tried one with raw and pasteurized. The first generation, he said, because he was mostly interested in the mouth, he said the jaw shrunk, the lower jaw shrunk. There was no room for wisdom teeth and they got all kinds of dental caries. Second generation, they got all the autoimmune diseases, all the diseases of man. He said, we had a cat hold it by its feet and drop it land right on its head. It couldn't flip over. Uh, one had 13 fractures. They started naming these cats like uh, scorpion and and Black Widow, because they never knew when they was going to get, uh, get attacked. By third generation, they were all sterile. Uh, the females uh, ate their young, and the males had no more interest in the females. So they just hung around together. They even took the cat excrement, and they would put it on the soil just to see if plants would grow from this. And it actually sterilized the soil. And weeds wouldn't even grow. And that was third generation. And so I asked Aladina, what is the purpose of this? And they said it's to extend shelf life. Extending shelf life is, uh, translates out to much in the way of dollars, and that's the purpose of it. And I says, well, what's homogenization? And he says, well, homogenization is the process of taking old milk that's starting to spoil and mixing it with new, and you can't tell. Now, they have to sell that through some kind of philanthropic approach saying that, you know, I mean, it used to be the wiener pig was always the little guy because you didn't get the cream. So everybody got the same amount of cream when they homogenized, but that was really not what the purpose was and if you've ever tried to ferment pasteurized milk it'll turn black and it'll smell horrible and you can't do it but it will sit on the shelf longer whereas the pioneers had regular milk and it would clabber my grandpa used to always take the milk from the cow and put it out on the screen porch and he would uh he let it clabber and ferment before he ate it he put it kept it away from the flies then he'd throw a 
banana on it or something, a little honey, and that's what he ate for his breakfast. That's what he liked. He lived a long time. So I don't know. We've made this transition that's really kind of interesting, and we're going to have to go back to the way it was, to the, the era that I was raised in was a wonderful era, and it was a healthy era. And it was, yeah, it was, uh, there was plenty of injuries and accidents, but it, not from the standpoint of health. Even uh, I stepped on my share of nails, you know. I remember one time I was, uh, I was feeding 80 cows. I just, I had to still milk them, but I was there by myself and I was in my cutoffs and I'm running across the top of a haystack that's about eight feet tall. And I was throwing bales into the trough. And then I jump off the end and I bust the strings that I'd run down as I was trying to get it done as fast as I could because I had a lot of work. It took quite a while to get them all milk. I jumped clear off into the trough this time, which was not recommended. I should have crawled down, but I just it was in a hurry. So I jumped clear off from about eight foot up. And when I landed in the hay, I took about three steps and I noticed my one leg was heavier than the other. And I looked down. The stalls that are made for the cows to stick their heads through are made from tuba sixes. And there was tuba six laying on the ground and I'd landed on one of the nails. Now, this is like a 20 penny nail, nice and rusty. Anyway, it came right through the top of my foot. So I tried to get it off my foot. <laughs> it wouldn't come off. So the muscles had tightened up so tight around it that I, um, I had to put it between two of the verticals and turn it sideways, grab underneath my knee and pull as hard as I could to get my foot off that darn nail. But I still had to knock the cow, so I still finished. I left quite a trail. But I got home and, and boiled up some water. And I boiled out some water and put salt in it and just soaked my foot in salt and uh, I was back to work the next day. So that's just the way it was. I mean, uh, that was just the lifestyle I lived. And it wasn't such a, there wasn't this big fear about getting sick. But it seemed like the healthy food was just uh, was good when I put together my D3K2, for example. You know, that was clear back in the 1890s. There was a gentleman whose brother died of tuberculosis. You know, one out of seven people on the planet Earth died of tuberculosis, biggest killer. And he was motivated to become a doctor, and so he became a doctor. And then he contracted tuberculosis. But he made an observation he says, People in the city were dying of tuberculosis, the people in the country weren't. So he says, I moved out to the country. Uh, drank clean water, ate good food, and I went for a walk in the sunshine every day, and it went away. So he set up what he called a sanatorium. It was a facility where they brought people in with tuberculosis. And you can see the old pictures are kind of fun to look at, where people are laying out on a balcony with a, a sheet droop, drooped over their groin area, and they're getting their, their sunshine. He just knew sunshine was curing it, and he didn't know what was in there that was doing it. He cured 80% of the tuberculosis, case, tuberculosis cases that came to his, and it grew to a very, very large facility. It wasn't until I think 1922, if I remember right, Dr. Mellenby, who doing the studies on rickets on children, where they were able to isolate something they called 7-dihydrocholesterol, which we know now as uh, vitamin D. It's not a vitamin, it's a steroid hormone in the same family as testosterone. <clears throat> but once the sun strikes it and converts it, then it has to go to the liver for the next step. And then to the kidney to have it finally packaged before it works. <clears throat> Vitamin D will move, you know, the phosphates, the, the calcium, magnesium into the blood from the food, from the gut. And that's where it'll stay. And we end up calcifying heart valves and, and arteries if it stays there. And that's where the fermented food came in because it was rich in meninquinone 7, which is what we call vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 is responsible for the protein in osteoblast that when it produces that protein osteocalcin, it has to be carboxylated. And meninquinone 7 is the one that activates that. So then it pulls all that calcium magnesium into the bones and teeth. doesn't stay in the blood. So when you do a cardiac arterial calcification, a CAC test, and look for occlusion in the artery, it's always calcium. And vitamin K2 will clean that up. <clears throat> vitamin K2 is rich in fermented foods, but we don't eat as many fermented foods anymore. The pioneers didn't have refrigeration. And so just about everything was probably collaborated. And, and, uh, and the value, they had plenty of K2 in it, so that was not a problem. <clears throat> so anyway, that's just things I learned on the farm, and I've applied it to my practice. Uh, I'm not sure if the PhD helped anything other than it got me to do research. I've read so many research articles, I can't even think of all of them. But it all comes back to the same thing. And I have found the principle of, I really believe 
bottom line is this. Uh, if, if, you're, if your life is in order, we'll say if your life is not in order, your practice never will be. I believe that uh, if you are honest in your dealings and you have integrity in your practice, you're entitled to intuition from someone who is a lot smarter than we are. And so I've just, uh, I've developed a very uh, confidence in what I've been able to feel and do from another source. And our success is very good. Don't fix everybody. But anyone that's willing to make a few changes, it, their life is always better. And I can't think of a condition that hasn't walked through here in these 42 years. I can't think of any that got worse. I can think of some that didn't get any better. But most of the people do better. And uh, I should retire, but they threaten me all the time. I would like to golf more and work less. <clears throat> but anyway, I just think that we're entitled to uh, inspiration if we're willing to receive it. I've never been motivated by money ever. My motive is just to help people have a better lifestyle. And the money takes care of itself. And so I've enjoyed a lot of success. So I think I've probably said enough. It's more than an hour. Do you want me to keep going? Or think? Uh, thank you. Anybody have any questions, comments? Uh, question here is, what's your go-to nutrient to start with? I mean, do you have like a base that you start with? I have what I call three superfoods. <clears throat> Basically, what it is, it's a multiple. So it's all mm -hmm. food-based multiple. The mm -hmm. next is vitamin, vitamin D3, K2. Right. It also I, I add magnesium. Magnesium helps to transition that to the active form of vitamin D. So mm -hmm. because if I run 100 tests, blood tests, 95 of them are low. Once again, the average margin is too wide. You know, if you look, if you go on uh, grassrootshealth.net, there's a very honest research group that has put in thousands and thousands of cases. And I like their information because it'll tell you, now if you reach 60 nanograms, there's, there's like 16 different cancers that don't even show up. There's no COVID deaths above 60. So, I mean, they say 30 is adequate, it's not. It's better than 15, but just about everyone is low. So that's the second one. The third one is a fish oil. You know, you have to, you can't make fish oil. It's, it's essential. It's a polyunsaturated essential. And you have to use a, a triglyceride version. You can't use an ethyl ester for it to work. And so you're talking brain, eye, skin, and hormones. So if you add, you know, the B vitamins with the synergistic trace minerals, and you add a D3K2 with magnesium and zinc, because it makes it work better. And then we add a fish oil to it. That's where we start with almost everyone. And there are different types of fish oils that we use, but I use a dry form that's got uh, phospholipids that really make it work and it just works great. I use krill if there's eye problems. You know, a person has xerosis or, you know, dry eyes or something like that. The astaxanthin in krill is extremely powerful. Also really helps bring down C-reactive protein. So it just depends on kind of the condition and what shows up. But those three right there, I just think everybody should take until they die. And that's what I tell my patients. Take those three till you die. Now, if you're over 40, we always add a digestive enzyme. There was a Canadian study that said if you, um, if you eat predominantly cooked meals in your life and you do it without enzymes, you will reduce your lifespan by one third. So over the age of 40, we always introduce a digestive enzyme, which I've also developed that. Beyond that, it's kind of specialty products. Like the cowboys want their cowboy powders. That's a specialty product. So I have different products that I'm doing all the time just based on what i see in conditions and but you got to start with changing your lifestyle and your diet if people are i always say at least eat things that god makes if you don't then i can't help you much Does that answer the question uh answers it for me one one question with the b vitamins do you put any faith in methylated b vitamin vitamins yeah i usually methylate i don't like uh, like cyanocobalamin which is a man-made of course that's a coal tar derivative we use methylcobalamin yeah you know yeah, folic acid is methylated. So I methylate the bees, yes, just because 
a goodly portion have of patients that come in have that challenge. And so I just make it so the liver doesn't have to methylate. But if you're using good, even a good digestive enzyme, which is really hydrochloric acid, which is trimethylglycine, there, you got three methyl groups right there. So you just ha have to help the liver. And, you know, the liver replaces itself very well. You can survive on 10% liver and actually feel pretty good. But it's not very good, especially with the high fructose corn syrup that's come along. We're getting, you know, non-alcoholic cirrhosis all the time, just from the liver trying to produce, trying to convert that into triglycerides. Okay. Question in the chat. What is the fastest fat for absorption? Uh, what it, what, I think say what, that once more. It, well, the question reads, fastest fat for absorption. Or is it the most, what, what fat is, is the best absorbed? I think that's the question. Well, it kind of depends on what you're after. Again, if you're looking at, a, at, at butyric acid in butter, for example, that's a two carbon chain fat. That's easy. And that's a postbiotic. That's what you want in the gut. That's what your probiotic is trying to make for you. That and propionic. So butyrate is simple. Butter, butter digests easily. Uh, olive oil is a monounsaturated. You know, it's an 18 carbon chain fat, but it only has one double double carbon bond. So it's, it takes pretty good heat. I always tell patients, cook in moisture. Don't cook in fat. You're destroying the good quality of the fat. So cook in moisture. Use a steamer, a crock pot, or a Dutch oven, like the pioneers did. And then always drizzle your fat on afterwards. And then you get the full benefit. So, you know, there's, there's good quality fats and there's just most of them out there are just terrible terrible mm -hmm. they're just gonna they're gonna make your brain plastic you won't be able to think straight okay what enzymes are you using so in a you know the the proteases the amylases lactases fibrases all the aces but some of those have a hard time getting together too getting along very well i had a hard time putting for example uh uh lipase with protease they like to destroy each other. So I had to take another avenue to come around to take care of that. So but that, all the ACEs basically, you know, I use uh, I use the syrup peptase or lumbokinase, those kind of enzymes. Those that's a that's really a silkworm saliva that digests the cocoon on the silkworm. And it, you know, it works great for inflammation, it works great for scar tissue, but you have to take that on an empty stomach, at least an hour before you eat. So I use those enzymes all the time, but that's more for, you know, acute injury and stuff like that. It works, works as good as any drug out there, in my opinion. And it's totally safe. If you take it with food, it's just going to digest your food. Okay. And what, what was that again? Just so we're clear. What was that again? Okay. If you're using like serapeptase, for example, just as an example, I don't use that to digest food, though it will. I use that on an empty stomach, at least an hour before, two hours after a meal. That will digest fibrin, scar tissue, and it'll reduce inflammation. It helps the monocyte do the Pac-Man trick on all the debris. So it works great when a person's got a swollen joint or an injured joint, or if they have a lot of scar tissue. You know, it those those aces are really really good. Mm -hmm. uh, question is, how do you sell your supplements, or are they available to direct consumer? Okay, that's a great question, and. <laughs> My problem really is these are, for me to put together what I'm putting together, they're fairly expensive. You can go on my website and I have a description of most of them, though my front office tells me I'm always behind and I don't have descriptions. So I'm always trying to work on that, put a simple description of each product. Most of them are very easy to understand because I named them so you knew what they were talking about. Sleep MTX, tinnitus MTX, you know, kidney MTX. You know what it's for because you can just see it by reading it. So basically, yes, we do have, we do a huge market in our practice. And I really haven't tried to get outside of that. I'm, I'm really not a very good marketer when it comes right down to it. But yes, you can go on my website and buy anything on there, I'm sure. And can you leave us either in the, in the chat, could you leave us your web, your web address or, or send it to me and I'll make sure everybody gets it? Sure, sure. So, I mean, yeah, sure. I'll be glad to send that to you. And you go on and you can look at them and you can read the ingredients. You can see what I've done. It's very but, difficult. This is really a hard, but but it's enjoyable. It's enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, I think everybody on one would appreciate. Um, you know, they're they're you know they're always looking for uh, something else to to add. So if you could type in the chat your 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 web address. Um, 
if you don't want you to, you don't, have, you don't have to if you don't want to. No, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm just I've just got to figure out how to do it on my phone here. That's the problem. But yes, uh, yes, I will if I can see where to do it. <laughs> usually the bottom the bottom right there, there's a three three little dots, and it'll if you hit that, the chat will show up. It's usually what uh, works. On my on my phone, it's not doing that, but okay. All right. Well, send me send it to me, and I'll I'll make sure okay. everybody gets. I'll it. send I'll send it directly to you. Yeah, yeah. and then you can give it to everybody. No, no, no worries. Okay. And you can right. read about the and if you have questions, you can send them to me. I'll be glad to answer them. Okay, so you're getting a lot of uh, uh, attaboys and kudos. Um, excellent information. Well done research. Um, we've got a we've got a, a whole bunch of those. So uh, you you can let that go to your head. Uh, a couple of excellence. So, um, well, well, appre I, I appreciate well, I just, appreciate. I hope my information is useful. I, I worry about that it's that it's not, but I had to give you a background so you can know why I think sure. the way I do. So, okay. I hope it's useful and always, I'll answer questions in the future. Okay, always, always, um, always helpful. Um, uh, uh, this is a HTP S dash dot WWMTX formula formulations.com is that you yes that is okay. all right thanks dave uh dave Kahn, he's one of our uh, good pals he, he found it so first. if you look up matrix formulations or if you look up mtxformulations.com it'll take you to the, the website where you can see the products got it and i just like but i haven't tried to market anything at all we we sell about all i can produce just through the office and if i you know, if I was independently wealthy and had a million bucks to spend on one of these, then I could maybe get the cost down where it would be useful for more people to market it. But mm -hmm. at this point in time, it's kind of a new venture in the last couple of years that I've done. And I just, I need to get to where I, where I can do a better job that way. Okay. I have every confidence in the products. They just, they work wonderfully and it. I can yeah. go into a lot more detail of how those frequencies come together and how I do it. And it's, it, it's, it's an amazing process. Um, so we had, a, and I, I spent some time with a, a lady named Carol McMakin, who has something called frequency-specific um, microcurrent, frequency-specific microcurrent that she does, which she, okay. she matches microcurrents to um, or, or organ organ uh, ab, you know anomalies, sure. and uh, she gave us is it any anything along those lines. Uh, yes, yes. I was first introduced to frequency by a doctor at Loyola. He was a PhD in the biochemistry department. And he, he started talking about quantum physics and vibrational frequency. Every cell in your body is a, is a, uh, it's a, it's a cell matrix. It's like a tuning fork. And there's a lot of studies done on that. Clear back when you go back to Royal Rife and through Tesla and all those people, they understood that each different tissue vibrated at a different frequency. And so if you could figure out what nutrient matched that frequency, that would be, that would be extremely helpful. So when we are, uh, if our cooking procedures are improper and you change the frequency of the food, see, it's not useful anymore. <clears throat> in fact, a lot of people cook in a way that they create free radicals by knocking an electron off oxygen. So now you've got to go get a bunch of antioxidants to try to donate the electron back to oxygen. So we're eating angry food. So I have different... I have a one piece of equipment I have, for example, I call it an AO scan, but it's a Russian scanner, actually. And over there, they had them in about every hospital. They developed it for the space program and they could treat and diagnose with sound. So if you take a, a, a middle C on the piano, we'll take, for example, and you go at 40 octaves, you can't hear it anymore. It turns red. It's still 735 nanometers, but it, you can't hear it. So whether you want to treat with sound or whether you want to treat with color, it doesn't matter. And that was the difference in Tesla and Rife. So that machine, they would put headphones on and through Wi-Fi, they could address the astronauts in the space shuttle. And they could actually treat just by taking the frequency and looking at it. And then they would treat it with the right frequency and see if they could jumpstart. Just like jumpstart in your car. So yeah, I can test the frequency about everything. I mean, everything clear to, you know, Tibet, the Tibetan bulls. You know, I was introduced to that by uh, Dr. Gaynor. You know, here's a traditional oncologist. And he says, when I introduced the Tibetan bulls, my success went through the roof. So you can take a frequency and get it close to an organ and bring it up to cell resonance, and it totally changes it. And that's what I'm trying to do with the nutrients, just so at least when you eat something, it will feed the organ with the right frequency. So, you know, you have the basic seven Indian chakras, for example. All that is, 
is middle C on the piano to the C below middle C. That's what the frequencies are. That's why music can heal. That's why there's so many things with in this world of quantum physics that I could kind of bury us go in that direction. So I won't go down that rabbit hole, but I just will say, yes, you've got to find the right frequency. And when you try, that's why you get this antagonism when you put things together. And it's whether you're working with uh, uh, nutrients or even essential oils, that's how they work. They work with frequency. But if you don't know the frequency, I, I don't look at ingredients. I don't care what the ingredients are in an essential oil. I just care what the frequency is. And I can show you how to use them and how they treat it effectively and properly. But, you know, that's another world and it's a world I'm interested in. And that's what I approach. And I don't get into it too much because I don't want to confuse somebody. And, but yes, there's a lot of different diagnostic equipment that will do that. I had a, just a quick example. Years ago, I had a guy come in and he had, he actually had prostate cancer and, and I was just going through and testing frequencies and he had a bad tooth. He had, uh, I think it was number seven. Anyway, if you look at the acupuncture chart, the teeth all represent organs. And the front four are genital urinary. And I said, and, I, and we were testing the teeth and there was one that was dead. And I said, you know, that one is right on the prostate meridian. Maybe that is the bad fuse in this circle that's not allowing your prostate to get the proper nu uh, nutrients and energy. So he flew up to the Northwest somewhere. He had a son that was, that was a dentist. And he took an x-ray of it and he said, he called me, he says, no, no, he said, the tooth's fine. It's, it doesn't hurt, it's virgin tooth. He played the saxophone. And I says, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not far enough down. This is when I first started into it. I said, I didn't even know what to tell you. Other than I really, uh, he talked to his, his son into just drilling it. <laughs> and then he called me back and he said, when he drilled that tooth, pus squirted out of the tooth. Because the plain film in dentistry is almost useless. If you have a cone beam, that works perfectly. But so many use just plain films. You missed way, way too many things. Anyway, so we took the tooth, corrected it, and within four months, his PSA was normal and he was doing well and he's still a patient and everything's fine. So there's a lot of stuff there, these interference fills that hide in our bodies from traumatic incidents or from surgeries, whatever. It's just like cutting a wire to your car. You gotta put the wires back. Anyway, it's always intriguing for me to do a little Sherlock Holmes and figure out where things are shut down or sedated. And that was really a doctor out of Loyola that taught me that. And he <laughs> learned it from Dr. Omura. If you want to read a lot of pages, Omura is a medical doctor in Japan, developed the O-ring test. And he's really a brilliant doctor. Well, respect. Anyway, an there's a lot of information. Was an acupuncturist? Pardon me? Was he an acupuncturist, a Dr. Oh, Omura? Uh-uh, no. Uh -uh. no. He does what's called therapy localization, the O-ring test. You, you can read him, read 10,000 pages on him if you want, but very accurate. The Curlian photography from Russia, see, they, they take a picture and they can picture, they can look at the energy that vibrates from the body. Some people call it an RM. They claim they can see it or something. I can't do any of that stuff. But just look at Curlian photography and look at the examples they have there, which was like a fractured arm. And you'll see this light going along the arm. And when it comes to the fracture point, it just turns black. There's nothing there. And until that bone slowly heals, that, that disappears, that point disappears. So if you run out of enough nutrition to heal that bone, it stays there. And they call that an interference field. And over time, it gathers and collects debris and it becomes a, a toxic focal site. And you have to be able to treat that to be able to take that out. I had a gal here in town. She's a mail carrier. She was bit by a brown recluse on the side of her gastroc. And she called me from the hospital. Three days she'd been on uh, IV uh, antibiotics and they said they were gonna have to actually amputate her leg because it was coming up her thigh. And she sent me a picture and it was pretty morbid. And I says, well, let's see if we can turn it on. She said, can you think you can do that? I don't wanna lose my leg. And I says, well, let's try it. And so we mixed up and it, this was actually a mud pack. But these, these old guys in these countries, they've been doing mud packs for 5,500 years. This is not mud out in your backyard. This is especially, this is more mud. So we packed it in and I said, just do this every day. Do it every day. You got nothing to lose. You're gonna lose your leg anyway. And she said, after she called me, she said, after two, two treatments, I knew it was gonna heal it. Eight treatments in three weeks, she was back to work again. It's all about cell resonance. And if you can figure out a way to do that, and there's many ways to do it, uh, your life changes. So most vitamins just suck the life out of you. They're just so poor. The way they put them together, is is it's embarrassing 
Yeah, but the packages look nice. I can ramble, so I just I want to stop. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a question here. I'm not sure what what relative where it came. It says, "What's your impression on calcium channel blockers?" Well, you know, it's it's a world I don't get into. Mm -hmm. So I I don't I don't like that approach. I think I think this body is God's finest creation, and mm -hmm. I think if you if you enhance it rather than block it. Uh, that's that's the problem. Most medications are blockers. That's the problem. I'd rather enhance it. So you have to ask, okay, what is the problem? And almost every patient, if you run any kind of, you run uh, uh, lipopolysaccharides or actomyosin or zonulin, you look at the zonulin gap or occludin, you'll find that it all starts in the gut. If you can't heal the gut, you're wasting your time with health. So that's where I start. I always start there. If I can't improve the gut, I'm I'm not going to. They'll come and say, what about my hormones? What about? I says, look. Everything has to be digested and absorbed here, and you're functioning at 6%. What would be the purpose in giving you a hormone? Maybe your body's perfectly capable, but it hasn't got the bricks to build a house. So let's start there. That's been very successful for me, almost every patient. If somebody comes in and they're functioning at 25%, I'm going, holy cow, you're doing something right, because I don't ever see that. Okay. We One last percent. Yes. One last, one last, one last question. So, um, do you have any uh, uh, tips for our uh, outpatient uh, early or, or late uh, responders for with with uh, COVID? Well, you know, there's a whole nother rabbit hole if you want me to go down it. But I would say, you know, number one, just 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 enhance the immune system. And, and vitamin D is one of the best enhancers of the immune system. So if you can get that steroid hormone up to at least 60 nanograms per milliliter, you're going to find that your immune system goes way up. So just do a test. I mean, you can, like uh, grassrootshealth.net, you can request a vitamin D test. You can request a fish oil or magnesium. Just poke your finger and send it to them. They'll put you in the data bank for one thing. And But if your immune system goes up, everything is going to work better. So, you know, yeah, you can use ionophores. You can use... Anything to get zinc in the cell and stop the replication, you know, that's always useful and it's, it's fairly easy to do. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think the cowboy powder has been so successful. But I have one called Immune MTX and I also have one with adaptogen herbs that strengthens the, the adrenal. When someone calls and they're in bed and sick, regardless of what it is, I don't care if it's COVID or influenza, which most of them are, I think, then just strengthen the adrenals and give them ionophores and they usually respond in a couple of days. Just give the body a chance to do it. I don't, I don't, I don't like to, what do we have? 360 trillion viruses in us right now and about 60 trillion bacteria. We got uh, only about 6 trillion cells. And why aren't we dead? It's because we got an immune system. And if you can take care of it, I mean, if you can allow those, that immune system to function properly, uh, you're just not going to get much. It's good to get an immune challenge and get a little sniffle once in a while, but you don't need to get a full blown disease. Just like when we're running around, we get mumps or something. Everybody played together and kept working. A couple of days, we had immunity and it was it was done. Lifetime immunity. That's a much better way to do it. So rather than trying to attack something simple, I try, I say let's uh, let's just strengthen your immune system and let this God given creation that He has done for us take care of the problem. And if you're if you're abusing your body, don't expect to get better. So if you're not if you're not walking your bare feet out in the dirt like we always did on the farm, if you're not getting sunshine, you're not drinking your water, you know, check your urine pH in the morning. If your urine pH between six, four, and seven, oh, first urination after five, hey, you got the balance. Okay, you've charged your batteries. You've getting, you've gotten rid of enough organic acids that you're fine. Slightly acidic. That's what you want. The whole dance changes at six point four. So those are cheap tests that you can do and see where you're at. If you're just rocking at 5.5 and you stay there, you can't leave it there because you're going to lose the battle. Got it. That was work of uh, Bechamp and Enderline. Those were brilliant doctors. Uh, Bechamp saved the silkworm industry in France after Louis Pasteur failed. He tried to sterilize their environment. Bechamp went in and fed them good food, saved the silkworm industry, and they weren't very good friends after that. But that's that's I, I don't like to target a particular condition. I like to just see, OK, how's your gut doing? How's your immune system doing? And blood work. I do lots of blood work and I do a lot more thorough than most do. 
I run antibodies. I like to look at zonulin and gap. I do all kinds of things, but it tells me what's happening. And then I have something to base it on. And I know if nutrition is helping and they can't lie to me. When they come back in in a month, they usually see them monthly. If, that, if, it, if they're not responding, they're cheating. <laughs> and they can cheat some, but not in the bad things. Okay, don't be, don't be sucking on uh, a high phosphorus drink that's going to excrete all your calcium on a Sokowith test. So that's how it works. You guys take away all the fun, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can still have chocolate if it's good chocolate. I mean, there's good and there's bad. You just have to make choices that are just, just better. Well, don't you have better. people come in and say, well, it, it's okay if I have a six pack every night, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not really that good for you. you know? <laughs> yeah. well, it's your body, but you're driving your insulin above 3.0. And when you do that, you get, you get four things. You get joint pain weight gain, you get fatigue, and you get brain fog. Now, if that's important to you, that you don't have those four things that don't drive your insulin up. And okay. the best way is to reduce carbohydrates and increase fat. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, go more Mediterranean, you know, have an omelet for breakfast, have a bowl of soup for lunch, maybe a salad or a steamed vegetable and a piece of chicken or fish for dinner. And be careful with the grains. Don't mm -hmm. take milk products if they're pasteurized. You can have cream because butyric acid can take some heat, but not ultra pasteurized and make sure animal fats are always clean. You can't get it from a CAFO, you know, a contained animal feeding operation, or you'll be, you'll get more estrogen than you want unless you like man boobs. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Anybody else have any questions, comments? Uh, I got an amen to homeopathy and it's not fun to be sick. <laughs> <In the chat. laughs> That's true. Okay, so so we it takes uh, a disease to be healthy though. It takes a good disease to be healthy. Okay, so we agree on that. Okay, well, thank you, Doctor Lafferty. I know we had a technical start, you know, some issues, yeah. but, but sure. um, it's it's been a it's been a delight, and um, thank you so much. Um, I hope you'll uh, you know you'll uh, join us again sometime, and if you don't mind, we can uh, you know put you in our our mailing list. We're we're here every Tuesday night. You bet. Um, Love and, to. And uh, we'll, we'll hope to hear from you again. Uh, I know I'm, I'm looking at your grassroots health nutrient uh, roots research center right now. So I think there's some things here we can add to our, add to our, uh, what we're doing here. That's great. Um, it's a great, find, great, great, honest company. You bet. You'll, you'll, you'll find that this group is our, uh, even though we are a subspecialty of the American Osteopathic Association, we're, we're kind of the rebels. And uh, I get along well with the osteopaths. They do all my injections for me. I, I think they're great. I love prolotherapy and, and, and they're, mm -hmm. I use them all the time. So mm -hmm. we get along very well. Okay. So um, anybody have any questions or comments? Uh, anything else um, they'd like to add? Um, next week, um, Dr. Zarin and I are going to uh, be uh, 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 doing our little. Uh, experiment with um, a, a, a full course on um, psychiatric illnesses um, uh, secondary to homeopathic with uh, Dr. Zarin put in your title. <laughs> um, I'll be talking about hormone uh, abnormalities uh, resulting from uh, resulting in psychiatric illnesses and what to do about it. And it's mostly, again, uh, uh, you know, just what you talked about tonight, Dr. Lafferty. So um, that'll be next week. Um, the, the link will be a little bit different. This is a paid um, a course, um, and uh, we'll be sending you some information on that. Um, Dr. Um, Burgess, if you're still here, uh, if you have anything yeah. to add for, um, so our next big conference is in October is OMED. Um, and it's in Boston at the last weekend in October, and we're putting that program together. Um, and um, and I'm going to be starting working on next year's uh, uh, Congress of Medical Excellence 5.0, um, which will be at the end of March. So uh, you may be getting an invitation, Dr. Lafferty. So um, I love it. Thank you very much. So um, thank you so much for your time. I really yeah, appreciate anybody, it. Anybody have any questions, comments, anything like that? Um, and uh, uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm getting wows and what a great speaker you are. So. Um, so there. <laughs> it won't go to my head, believe me. Okay. <laughs> thank yeah, you so yeah, much. I got you an attaboy. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Anybody have anything to add? Dr. Burgess, anything?
Oh, just everything's going good with OMED, and we're going to have a group meeting, a town hall kind of thing in about a week. And I just want, just want to thank Dr. Lafferty for all the common sense and wondrous things he's doing. I, I was raised on a common sense farm myself, an organic farm, milking the cows and doing that stuff, and only sure. wound up and wound up going to medical school after getting busted around in the military. Good. But I, I do want to say one thing. I trained in West Virginia and I trained in Michigan. So in Michigan, where we had Flint and Detroit and the Cleveland Clinic and some of the finest you know, training programs there were, the finest hospitals, supposedly. So when the uh, king of Saudi Arabia, would come, uh, Saudi Arabia would come over, he would go to Flint, Michigan. But I noticed the about the average age of the hospital patients was between 50 and 60. When I came back to West Virginia, when everybody's poor living on the farm, the average age was 70 to 80. And it made me think just that common sense of what you're talking about. So uh, Absolutely. I'm a believer in what you're saying and appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And um, um, anybody else? Comments, questions, complaints? Um, we'll have, uh, uh, we always uh, record these and we put them on our website. Um, and, and everybody's always welcome to, um, you know, per, per, peruse them. It's aosrd.org slash webinars. That's, it's okay with you since you're the speaker, Dr. Lafferty. So, um, and so there's a lot of content on there by now. We've been doing this for almost two years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, every week. So That's there's great. a, there's a lot of information on there. Um, and um, you know, pretty much al almost every integrative health topic you can think of, we, we, we've, we've covered in one way or another. Um, and uh, um, and we're, we're pretty proud of that, actually. Um, and uh, so um, uh, then next week, uh, we will, we will uh, be uh, 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 showing you sending, you, sending you some information on that. I hope you join us. I hope it's worth your while. Um, it will probably go quite le quite long. Um, so um, you know, you eat your Wheaties be beforehand or have a snack around because it'll probably be at least, I'm thinking at least three hours. It might even be longer because uh, we have a lot to cover. And since we're only doing it once a month, um, you know, we want to we wanna sort of give you all a succinct, um, you know, uh, uh, begin uh, beginning, uh, middle and end. Um, and, uh, you know, we're calling it the C Canadian U.S. Uh, uh, Consortium on Homeopathic and Functional Medicine. That's our formal title. So, wow, that's great. So that's a, that's, a, that's a big chunk to chew off. So, I like okay. It. <laughs> so, okay. Dr. Lafferty, thank you so much. It's been a delight. Um, and um, everybody else, um, we'll see you again uh, next time. Same, same time, same place. Um, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll see you shortly. Okay. Good night. All right, good night. Thank you. Any anything else to add, John?